Chapter 22 How My Sea Adventure Began I hope you enjoyed that into the newly styled overlay. We had it yesterday, but for the, for the new people. There we go. There was no return of the mutineers. Not so much as another shot out of the woods. They had got their rations for that day, as the captain put it. He's put that in inverted commas, not me. And we had the place to ourselves. And uh, thank you very much for the follow, Amy Jones. And a quiet time to overhaul the wounded and get dinner. Squire and I cooked outside in spite of the danger. And even outside, we could hardly tell what we were at. For horror of the loud groans that reached us from the doctor's parents. So yeah, a lot of people have been na pretty nastily cut up. Musket balled, bayoneted, bashed during this big piratical fight. Out of the eight men who had fallen in the action, only three still breathed. That one of the pirates who had been shot at the loophole. That's... He shot him. He got shot through one of the sort of... The, the, the holes for, for muskets in, in the stockade. They're not, descri they're not describing a part of him that has been shot by loophole. Uh, he's not been shot in the loophole. <laughs> um, he has been shot with a musket, which has been aimed through a hole in the stockade, which is the wooden fortress that they are holed up in against the pirate. One of the men had been shot in the loophole. Uh, Hunter and Captain Smollett. And of these first two... And of these, the first two were as good as dead. The mutineer, indeed, died under the doctor's knife. And Hunter, do what we could, never recovered consciousness in this world. He lingered all day, breathing loudly like the old buccaneer at home in his apoplectic fit. He's referring to, the, uh, referring to Billy Bones. Dear old Billy Bones, of course, very early on in the stream we encountered, living in Jim's pub, just always pissed up on rum, always knocking things over, and for some reason always breathing really loudly through his nose. <laughs> <laughs> like that. <laughs> so poor Hunter, poor loyal Hunter, poor poor loyal Mr. Bates Hunter. Is he? I can't remember which one's Mr. Bates. <laughs> But the bones of his chest had been crushed by the blow and his skull fractured in falling. And sometime in the following night, without sign or sound, he went to his maker. God. As for the captain, his wounds were grievous indeed, but not dangerous. No organ was fatally injured. Anderson's ball, for it was Job that shot him first, had br they're obviously referring to a musket ball there, a bullet. For it was Job, Anderson, that shot him first, had broken his shoulder blade and touched the lung. Not badly. The second had only torn and displaced some muscles in the calf. <laughs> so two, two shots sort of grazed him there. He was sure to recover, the doctor said. But in the meantime, and for weeks to come, he must not walk, nor move his arm, nor so much as speak when he could help it. My own accidental cut across the knuckles was a flea bite. Dr. Livesey patched it up with plaster and pulled my ears for me into the bargain. He's pulled his ears. Why has he done that? Pulled his ears? What's wrong with him? Is, is that like pinning your ears when people have their ears pinned back if their ears stick out too much? Why is he doing that to this six-year-old cabin boy? The mysteries of the 18th century are now. After dinner, the squire and the doctor sat by the captain's side, a while in consultation. And when they had talked to their heart's content, it being then a little past noon, the doctor took up his hat and pistols, girt on a cutlass, put the chart in his pocket, and, with a musket over his shoulder, crossed the palisade on the north side and set off briskly through the trees. 
Gray and I were sitting together at the far end of the blockhouse, to be out of earshot of our officers consulted, and Gray took his pipe out of his mouth and fairly forgot to put it back in again. So thunderstruck was he at this occurrence. What, Gray? I think maybe Gray is the Mr. Bates one. Why, in the name of Davy Jones, said he, is Dr. Livesey mad? Why, no, says I. He's about the last of his crew for that, I take it. Well, shipmate, said Gray, mad he may not be, but if he... This getting a bit, um, it's getting a bit, uh, Sajora Morm on this. Well, Khaleesi, mad he may not be, but if he's not, you mark my words, I am. I take it, replied the doctor. The doctor has his idea, and if I'm right, he's going now to see Ben Gunn. I was right as appeared later. But in the meantime, the house being stifling hot and the little patch of sand inside the palisade ablaze with midday sun, I began to get another thought into my head, which was not by any means so right. What I began to do was to envy the doctor, walking in the cool shadow of the woods with the birds about him and the pleasant smell of the pines, while I sat grilling with me clothes stuck to the hot resin, and so much blood about me, and so many poor dead bodies lying all around, that I took a disgust of the place that was almost as strong as fear. All the time I was washing out the blockhouse, and then washing up the things from dinner. This disgust, and then so with the making him do the bloody washing up. Ah, we have lost many good shipmates. Ah, their blood is all over our faces. Jim... Get the fairy liquid. Hello from Russia, toxic or not. Get the... Get the fairy liquid, Jim. Sort out that roasting tray from them fish fingers. So, naturally. It, it is a good book, toxic or not. I hope... Uh, no. We'll carry on, we'll carry on. <clears throat> All the time, I was washing out the blockhouse and then washing up the things from dinner. This disgust and envy kept growing stronger and stronger, till at last, being near a bread bag and no one then observing me, I took the first step towards my escapade and filled both pockets of my coat with biscuit. And by biscuit, he obviously means ship's biscuit, which would be what they're all eating, which is kind of horrible cracker-like bread probably full of uh, probably full of weevils um, he's not just that he's not just had a couple of bu a bu a bu a bu bourbons chocolate bourbons chocolate bourbons 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 have I ever said that word out loud have I only seen the name on the packet chocolate bourbons chocolate bourbons chocolate bourbons who do I think I am Custard creams. He's, he's, not, he's not eating custard creams. He's having ship's biscuit. I was a fool, if you like. And certainly I was going to do a foolish, overbold act. But I was determined to do it with all the precautions in my power. These biscuits. Not custard creams. Ah, oh, let's let him be custard creams. He's got, a, he's got two pockets full of custard creams. Should anything befall me, would keep me, at least, from starving till far on in the next day. The next thing I laid hold of was a brace of pistols. And as I already had a powder horn and bullets, I felt myself well supplied with arms. Powder horn and bullets, as we know, we've talked about this before on the stream, obviously to fire the pistols, he needs to fill the pistols with gunpowder um, and then put the bullet into, the, the, into the, the muzzle of the gun and then ram the bullet down and then pour the powder into the firing pan and then fire the trigger and then the lock hits, the flint hits, the gunpowder in the pan pff, sparks like that fires the ball that's how a pistol works that's why he's got a powder horn and bullets and the pistol okay i felt myself well supplied with arms as for the scheme i had in my head it was not a bad one in itself i was to go down the sandy spit that divides the anchorage on the east from the open sea find the white rock i had observed last evening and ascertain whether it was there or not that ben gunn had hidden his boat a thing quite worth doing as I still believe. 
But as I was certain I should not be allowed to leave the enclosure, my only plan was to take French leave and slip out when nobody was watching. Take French leave, I suppose, is, uh, I suppose is an Irish goodbye. He's, li he's leaving without saying a word. Done that at many a... Done that at many a party. It's a thing to do. You don't have to say bye to loads of people. Then if there's anybody in particular you want to say bye to, drop them a text the next day when they're sober. Take French leave. And slip out when nobody was watching. And that was so bad a way of doing it as made the thing itself wrong. But I was only a boy. I was only six. And I had made my mind up. Well, as things at last fell out, I found an admirable opportunity. The squire and Grey were busy helping the captain with his bandages. The coast was clear. I made a bolt for it over the stockade and into the thickest of trees. And before my absence was observed, I was out of cry of my companions. This was my second folly. Far worse than the first, as I left but two sound men to guard the house. But like the first, it was a help towards saving all of us. I took my way straight for the east coast of the island, for I was determined to go down the seaside of the spit to avoid all chance of observation from the anchorage. It was already late in the afternoon, although still warm and sunny. As I continued to thread the tall woods, I could hear from far before me not only the continuous thunder of the surf, but a certain tossing of foliage and grinding of boughs. Again, very, very sleep sounds vibes. Again which showed me the sea breeze had set in higher than usual. Soon, cool draughts of air began to reach me, and a few steps farther I came forth into the open borders of the grove and saw the sea lying blue and sunny to the horizon, and the surf tumbling and tossing its foam along the beach. I have never seen the sea quiet round Treasure Island. The sun might blaze overhead, the air be without a breath, the surface smooth and blue, but still these great rollers would be running along all the external coast, thundering and thundering by day and night, and I scarce believe there is one spot in the island where a man would be out of earshot of their noise. I walked along beside the surf with great enjoyment, till thinking I was now got far enough to the south. I took the cover of some thick bushes and crept warily up, the, up to the ridge of the spit. Behind me was the sea, in front the anchorage. The sea breeze, as though it had the sooner blown itself out by its unusual violence, was already at an end. <laughs> Thanks for the follow, David Jackson. Sorry about the zombie. <laughs> it had been succeeded by light, variable airs from the south and southeast. Oh, wow, yeah. Carrying great banks of fog, and the anchorage under lee of Skeleton Island lay still and leaden as when we first entered it. The Hispaniola, in that unbroken mirror, was exactly portrayed from the truck to the water line, the Jolly Roger, hanging from her peak. Alongside lay one of the gigs, silver in the stern sheets, him I could always recognise, while a couple of men were leaning over the stern bulwarks, one of them with a red cap. It's Psycho Willy Winky! The scariest and most ridiculous pirate on the Spanish main. One of them with a red cap, the very rogue that I had seen some hours before, stride legs upon the palisade. Psycho Willy Winky. Deadly, absolutely deadly. Deadly killer. No one, no one dares laugh at him to his face. But he is known as Psycho Willy Winky because he's always wearing a little red nightcap. Apparently they were talking and laughing, though at that distance, upwards of a mile, I could of course hear no word of what was said. All at once, they began, so they're sort of going, Oh, then he said, Ha, 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 All at once, there began the most horrid, unearthly screaming, which at first startled me badly. Though I had soon remembered the voice of Captain Flint, Long John Silver's parrot, and even, even thought I could make out the bird by her bright plumage as she sat perched upon her master's wrist. See, she doesn't actually sit on Long John's shoulder. 
in the book. She sits on his wrist. So just think of that next time you're putting a parrot on your shoulder to be a pirate. I say that, but even earlier I had the cat on my shoulder pretend to be a pirate, so who am I to judge? So the screaming the He's like, oh, no, please. But it's just Long John Silver's parrot. Nothing to panic about. Yeah, yeah, like that. Soon after, the jolly boat shoved off and pulled for shore. And the man with the red cap, Psycho Willy Winky, and his comrade went below by the cabin companion. Just about the same time, the sun had gone down behind the spyglass, the big hill. And as the fog was collecting rapidly, it began to grow dark in earnest. I saw I must lose no time if I were to find the boat that evening. The white rock, visible enough above the brush, was still some eighth of a mile further down the spit, and it took me a goodish while to get up with it, crawling, often on all fours, among the scrub. Night had almost come when I laid my hand on its rough sides. Right below it there was an exceedingly small hollow of green turf, hidden by banks and a thick underwood about knee-deep, that grew there very plentifully. And in the centre of the dell, sure enough, a little tent of goat skins. Uh, like what the gypsies carry about with them in England. Obviously, this was written at a different time. He's referring to, um, uh, to travellers, Rome, R Roma people, most likely in 18th century England. Um, there would be uh, travelling Roma people, I would have thought. In the southwest of England, in the 18th century, 1769, that Jim's referencing that they're still the, 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 well tents or um, the traditional Roma caravan. I wouldn't. I, I don't know actually. I'm not educated enough to know exactly what Jim's referencing there. But obviously, he's not using the best of language to describe it. Robert Louis Stevenson. I dropped into the hollow, lifted the side of the tent, and there was Ben Gunn's boat. Homemade, if ever anything was homemade. A rude, lopsided framework of tough wood, and stretched upon that a covering of goat skin, with the hair inside. The thing was extremely small, even for me, and I can hardly imagine that it could have floated with a full-sized man. There was one thwart, set as low as possible, a kind of stretcher, in the bows and a double paddle for propulsion so if anyone knows how boats are built there's a pretty um it's a pretty comprehensive explanation there it's basically uh sounds to me uh, oh how weird right i was literally about to say this but robert louis stevenson has beat me to it i had not then seen a coracle such as the ancient Britons made. But I have seen one since, and I can give you no fairer idea of Ben Gunn's bout than by saying it was like the first and worst coracle ever made by man. But the great advantage of the coracle it certainly possessed, for it was exceedingly light and portable. Here's something about coracles. Coracles came up a lot uh, during my degree. Why? Because I studied um, early medieval British uh, languages, very cool. And in the uh, Irish um, the Irish pilgrimage tales, people often show up in a coracle. Why? What is a coracle? A coracle is basically half an egg cup. Well, an egg cup. So half an egg. It's, it's an egg cup, basically, made of usually of, of like Ben Gunn's boat, goat skins and wood. Um, you get in your coracle, it's, it's watertight, and uh, off you pop. In your little coracle, very small, very light, very quick. What do the early medieval Irish monks do with their coracles? They get in them on the west coast of Ireland, facing the Atlantic. They float off with no oars, no rudder, no nothing. They just climb in and they float away. Why? What did the early Christians do? They always went on pilgrimages. They always went... The early monastic Christians were always going off in the Middle East, the birthplace of Christianity, in case anyone didn't, didn't know that for some reason. Um, there was a desert. There was a massive desert. And if you wanted to go off and be a monk, an anchorite, or some such, you go off into the desert. Big, vast desert. Dry desert, nothing there. You know, as... Uh, What's the word? Um, is pilgrimage the right word? Uh, 
pilgrimage, um, a journey of uh, self-denial, that sort of thing, you know. Um, are there any deserts in early medieval Ireland? No, there are not. What they've got instead is the Atlantic Ocean. That's the desert. A never-ending stretch of water that, as far as they're concerned, stretches off either to um, uh, the uh, Tuatha de Danann, the uh, realm of the um, the realm of the of the other people, the um, the the other the fairies, I guess you would say, the fairies. Tuatha de Danann is that the right one? The kingdom of the I think of the right Tuath, um, or to Breshal, mythical island on the other side of the world, past the veil of our physical realm. Um, mostly they're just washed up on the shore of England, or in one case, on the shore of the Iberian Peninsula in Spain. They would travel very far, those monks and those coracles. They just get carried by the sea currents. Many of them drowned. That's your coracle, and that's what Jim has just clambered into. Although it sounds like this one's got some tools. Well, and that's Robert Louis Stevenson saying, well, not me. Well, now that I'd found the boat, you would have thought I'd had enough of truantry for once. But in the meantime, I had taken another notion and become so obstinately fond of it that I would have carried it out, I believe, in the teeth of Captain Smollett himself. This was to slip out under cover of the night Cut the Hispaniola adrift and let her go ashore where she fancied. I had quite made up my mind that the mutineers, after their repulse of the morning, had nothing nearer their hearts than to up anchor and away to sea. This, I thought, would be a fine thing to prevent. And now that I had seen how they left their watchmen unprovided with a boat, I thought it might be done with little risk. So Jimmy's going to float out to the ship and just cut it loose so it just floats away to scupper the pirates down I sat to wait for darkness and made a hearty meal of biscuit custard creams it was a night out of 10,000 for my purpose the fog had now buried all heaven as the last rays of daylight dwindled and disappeared, absolute blackness settled down on Treasure Island. And when at last I shouldered the coracle and groped my way stumblingly out of the hollow where I had supped, supped his biscuits, there were but two points visible on the whole anchorage. So he's completely undercover, his Jim here. One was the great fire on shore, by which the defeated pirates lay carousing in the swamp. Blah, them pirates. Just, just that boozing up with all the mosquitoes. <laughs> so the one point visible, one of the points visible was a great fire on the shore, with which the defeated pirates like carousing in the swamp. The other, a mere blur of light upon the darkness, indicated the position of the anchored ship. She had swung round to the ebb. Her bow was now towards me. The only lights on board were in the cabin, and what I saw was merely a reflection on the fog of the strong rays that flowed from the stern window. The ebb had already run some time, and I had to wade through a long belt of swampy sand, where I sank several times above the ankle, before I came to the edge of the retreating water, and, wading a little way in, with some strength and, de and dexterity, set me coracle keel downwards on the surface. End of... Chapter.